I am. Hi. It's time. Hi. Mmm. Oh, ginger ale. It's hot. It's hot. It's hot again. Hi. Hi. Are you there? Yeah, you're all there, right? There you are. There's the little bubbles. There they go. Hello. Hello. I've got shadows. I've shadows on my face. Oh, that's much nicer. Yes. Hello. So, it's, um, it's Saturday. Is it Saturday already? It's Saturday. I'm doing very, but this is my new blouse, new blouse, very lilac-y, purpley, purpley. Went with the purple again. Hey, so, what a day, what a day. We have, we have things. Mm. People send me things again. Mm. Mm. I got more goldfish. I love goldfish. So, um, Saturday, August the 22nd, Many of you probably got your email saying, your package has been shipped. I mean, it literally hit the desk at the post office. I guess it'll get shipped, like, <laughs> one day. We'll see when they get to it. But it was on the table in the post office. Um, today is August 22nd, which is National Surgical Oncologist Day. Well, that's important because, yeah, hello, you want surgical oncologists. If you got cancer, you really want surgical oncologists around. Um, National Be an Angel Day. Oh, that's every day here with you guys. Um, National Bao Day, uh, B-A-O, which is a Chinese dumpling. It was a cartoon. Have you seen the cartoon Bao? It's about the woman who Chinese dreams of a Chinese dumpling comes to life. It's like adorable. Um, never, <laughs> never been better day. Not ever better been. Been better day. Being, being, B-E-A-N. Being better day. Um... Bean is the name of a uh, therapy dog. So there we go. And therapy dogs are good. So he's a very good therapy dog. Oh, oh, it's National Tooth Fairy Day. Did you have the Tooth Fairy? Did Tooth Fairy come to your house when you were a kid? When you had teeth fall out? Did you have the Tooth Fairy? How much did the Tooth Fairy? Did, did, is the Tooth Fairy a thing in other countries? Because you guys, I don't know. Tooth Fairy thing in, in America, the Tooth Fairy, it's like huge. I don't know if the Tooth Fairy is comes to people's houses in other countries. But in America, when your teeth, baby teeth fall out, you put it under your um, pillow, and um, the tooth fairy comes and brings you brings you money. And I remember it used to be like, oh, but a quarter was a big deal, and then it was like a dollar. Oh, what did I get? I think I got a quarter when I was really, really like when it first started. But I think I got a dollar a couple times. Got how much my mom had in her purse. <laughs> But the Tooth Fairy, we love the Tooth Fairy. Um, and you will need the Tooth Fairy because it is also National Pecan, 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 Pecan Tort Day. Oh, come on. They did Pecan Pie. They did Chocolate Pecan Pie. And now Pecan Tort. No, they're really working it with the um, pecans, trying to sell them in the summertime. Yep, 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 yep. Oh, uh, so you don't get anything for the, the teeth in the other countries? I don't know. Now, why am I I'm hauling this up? The other day, someone said, oh, that huge book behind you that says Gothic. What the heck is that? That is, oh, God, I can hardly even lift this thing. Ugh, Gothic. It is indeed architecture, sculpture, paint. This was left to me by my friend Jess Peterson. If you read my book, remember Jess Peterson? How uh, I took his ashes to Venice. Mm. And he loved that stuff. So, this is, um, this, um, for instance, is a huge, um, Salisbury. Salisbury in the, um, south of England is Salisbury Cathedral Trinity Chapel. There you go. It's huge. It's full of stuff like that. Um, Notre Dame. No, all the Notre Dame stuff is in here. Um, Winchester. Win Winchester Cathedral. I'm probably hallucinating, but I thought I remember there was a song. I was really little, and I'm 100 years old, so it was a long time ago. Winchester Cathedral. Am I crazy, or does anybody else remember this? Winchester, and it was like the guy with the weird voice. Winchester Cathedral. Does anybody remember this, or am I just completely insane? Okay, good. Um, but yes, Winchester Cathedral is in here. Oh, and uh, places in England, Wales, France, Italy, Venice. Um, really, really gorgeous stuff. Where is that? Bruges! Bru You've heard of Bruges, and there's that tower in Bruges. There it is, Bruges! Someone remembers it! Cathedral! I don't know. Like, it's just, it's all I remember. I was like, 
five or something. Um, this is the heaviest book in the world. That's why I don't take off the shelf. Oh, ow. Uh, <laughs> but yes, it's a, yes, okay, someone else. You're 58, you remember that song, Winchester Cathedral. Okay, so I didn't, I didn't just completely hallucinate the entire thing. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, so we did the date. Gifts. You guys, with the sending me things, always the sending me things. So, um, Steve and Teresa in Springdale, Arkansas, sent stuff. They sent me all this talk of pecans. So, this is, notice it's already been opened, a uh, pecan brittle. Where's the pecan brittle? The pecan pecan brittle came from Silver Dollar City near Brent. Oh, Silver Dollar, who's been to Silver Dollar City? It's very nice. A lot of stuff like pecan brittle. Um, oh, lots of stuff there. And, um, mm, also, peanut butter, chocolate peanut, chocolate peanut butter fudge. Ooh, oh, that sounds so rich. Um, more cat bonnets. This, I have, I have not been able to get the cats to wear bonnets. I really have. I've tried. I have so tried. Um, but I have more, <laughs> just in case, I have lots of cat bonnets. So cute. But the one that gets me, thank you, by the way. Thank you, Stephen Teresa. Thank you. Thank you very much. Those lovely things. This is the one that got me. Um, Linnell had been posting pictures. I think it was Linnell posted. Um, a, my truck. I, I had a 1957 Ford Ranchero when I was 16. That's it. We need to dark out. They draw all my baby left. Okay, now I'm like going to have flashbacks this one. Um, I had a truck. It was my first car. It was like literally 15 and a half actually when I bought it. And um, uh, had to. I was like learning to drive and bought a car. Um, but it, uh, it was a 57 Ford Ranchero pickup truck. And I have here. Yeah, she's. It was like this. Um, mine was red and white. This is that dark blue. That's black and white. It's black and white. This is Racing Champions Mini Minute Mint Mini Mint Mint Motor Trend Classic Diecast Collectibles, and um, um, Steve apparently this enormous enormous collection and was like I decided to I guess redo the house it was like I have eight million cars um, and found a home for them and this is you can play hold this up close enough you can see it there it is there's a truck there's a truck there it is there's the truck that I literally this is exactly this is the car that I drove when I was sixteen. So, stuff. That is stuff. That's what they, so, just all this stuff from Silver Dust City. Oh, and then, wow, that's a lot of cars. Such pictures of how many billions of cars he had. Um, so, there you are. Those are things. Those are things. So, we're still reading um, William Anderson's Laura Ingalls Wilder's biography. Um, definitely be reading this tomorrow. So, what on Monday? Um, I I think I'm going to order, I think it's called Young Pioneer, Hurricane Roar, or is it Young Pioneers now, what have you, but I have, I have, I'm like, try not to knock over the camera as I lean out of shot here, oh, yeah, so, it came in the mail, Prairie Lotus, and this is this Linda Sue Park, it's, it's, I've been looking at it, it's nice, it's a little girl, um, named Hannah, in Dakota Territory in 1880, but she's half Chinese, and so dealing with, and the usual stuff, it's her pa and her ma and the Indians and the settlers and all the things, but you know, occasionally she runs into some people where things are like weird because she's half Chinese and it's 1880, but it's really cool. It's like, she's totally like a little Laura type and, and you know, hanging out and making cornbread and hanging out with her pa, so it's kind of cute. We might, we might have to check this out. There you are. But back to Bill Anderson. Things have really gotten exciting. I got excited yesterday because it was all about publishing. <laughs> nerd! Book nerd! Nerd, 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 nerd. Yeah. Are you on Cameo? I most certainly am on Cameo. I am all, I'm on Cameo. I'm on Coach the World. I'm on, I'm on everything. Um, I got excited yesterday because it was all about publishing. It was all about how she made the deal with Harper, Harper, Harper Brothers, uh, which became Harper Collins, and all about agents and editors and, and book publishing. And I was like, ah, because I'm, I'm a nerd. Um, so, yeah, she's now put uh, finishing By the Shores of Silver Lake, and she is realized that she has to crank out a whole bunch of these books because she has saved the publishing industry in the middle of the Great Depression. Um, so now we're at Chapter 17, 
our quiet home, which really isn't that quiet, but because by this time, Laura's a giant celebrity and doing personal appearances, and so is Rose, and, and it's like cray-cray, folks. So hopefully she gets a piece of quiet. Our quiet home. By the Shores of Silver Lake was published in, oh, oh, we're almost up to World War II here, 1939. It became a Newbery Honor book, just as Little House in the Big Woods and On the Banks of Plum Creek had been. The book was eagerly awaited at bookstores, libraries, and schools all over America. Now, now she was like doing the buy it now pre-publish. She was like so popular. People were waiting for her books to come out. I'm going to burp. Okay, okay good. Um, Laura's books were selling thousands of copies each year. No longer did she worry about income to support Rocky Ridge Farm. The royalty checks from Harper and Brothers paid more than the farm had ever earned. Yay! 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 Laura made money for the books. Yay! We're good. That's good. Laura was grateful for her royalty checks, and she was thankful to Rose for her ideas and encouragement during the writing of Little House books. In January 1939, she wrote to Rose, Yesterday, I was thinking how unbelievable it is that we are so comfortably situated. Without your help, I would not have had the royalties from my books in the bank to draw on. Laura titled her next manuscript, The Hard Winter. Oh, I think we all know that became The Long Winter. It described the blizzardy winter of 1880 to 1881 in Desmet and how the first settlers in the town survived it. In the middle of writing the book, Laura suddenly wanted to visit Desmet again. It was the first of June, Laura explained. The days were lovely, warm, going somewhere days. She and Manley decided to travel alone to the 1939 Old Settlers Day in Desmet. Old pioneers <laughs> and friends gathered annually in Desmet on June 10th for the Old Settlers Day reunions and festivities. Now, we still have these kind of like Old Settlers Days, the Little House in the Prairie Days in these towns. Can you imagine going to Old Settlers Days and you're actually an old settler? That'd be very strange. Mm. Old settlers. <laughs> Friends thought we should not take such a trip by ourselves, Laura admitted. But Manley declared, I have driven horses all over that country and the roads to it, and I can drive a car there. They promised Rose to drive slowly and carefully. Because what, isn't he like 80 now? Yeah. If we find it too hard, we can come home any time, Laura assured her. In Desmet, the Wilders enjoyed the festivities of Old Settlers Day. Laura collected historical information to help her writing and made a friendly visit to Aubrey Sherwood, who was the publisher of the Desmet News. The Wilders visited three days with Grace and Nate before driving across the plains to see Carrie in Keystone. That's pretty good. They got their, you know, their relatives there. Well, now there's a good question. Bill Graff just said, I wonder if Laura saw the Wizard of Oz in 1939. I mean, they're driving around to Desmet. Which is Ross. Everybody knew it was happening in all the theaters. Dun, dun, dun. We don't know. Mm -mm. Laura and Manley drove with Carrie along the winding roads near Mount Rushmore, as they had done before. We all talked together, Laura said, of childhood days and Pa and Ma and Mary. From Carrie's home, the Wilders drove to Wyoming and Colorado and came back home through Kansas. Okay, that's pretty far. For the couple who were saying, well, we're getting on in years, so let's not drive too far. They just went all the way across the country. As always, they were glad to return home. You folks have the prettiest place in this whole country, a friend told them. And Manly and Laura agreed. Laura and Manly traveled no more. Oh, how old are they now? Good heavens, that's right. She's like, they're just, yeah, they're getting, yeah, okay. They settled down into the peaceful days of quiet life. On Sundays, they drove to the Methodist church in town, and on Wednesdays, they went to Mansfield again for groceries and shopping. They attended church dinners and socials and liked to take long drives to the Ozark country. I love to go for a drive as much as I ever did, Laura said. Well, that was their whole dating thing, and their whole thing when they first met was the going out on the buggy rides and sleigh rides, so now I guess they took the Chrysler out now. <laughs> 
Mm-mm. The daily routine on Rocky Ridge still started early with Laura cooking a seven o'clock breakfast. Okay, like they're essentially retired and she's still doing seven o'clock breakfast. Manly tended the four milk goats and two calves in the barn. Then he worked in the garden or his workshop. He split wood for the range and hauled it into the house in a wagon drawn by a burrow. So he donkeys and So it's already 1939 and every they've got electricity and they've got a phone. And she's driving a car, but he's still like, I'm going to go chop some wood, put it in a cart with a burrow, pretend. But it's still the 1800s. We are not really farming, Laura explained. It has been increasingly difficult to get help and largely impossible to do so at wages the farm could pay. The beautiful rock house and 40 acres of land were sold. Ah, Bruce Prock, that's the guy who was doing all the work there, and his family moved away. So the tenant house and another plot of land across the road from the farmhouse were also sold. This left the Wilders 130 acres of the land, still a lot, all in pasture and meadowlands with a timber lot for wood. Laura's days were always busy ones. I do all my own work, she said, and to care for a ten-room farmhouse is no small job. Besides the cooking and the baking, there's the, the churning to do. She's still churning butter. It's 1939 go to the store. But, you know, she's got a couple of cows, so I might as well churn the butter. I make all my own butter from cream off the goat milk. Ooh, goat's milk, goat's milk, cheese, goat cheese. Oh, we love the goat cheese. So, well, there you go. So they're making, like, goat cheese and stuff. Goat milk, goat milk butter. Mmm. There's always sewing on hand, and my mending is seldom finished. Each day, when the mailman drove by, Laura left for a half-mile walk to the mailbox. Can you imagine walking half a mile to your mailbox? Really far. The Wilder mailbox at the side of the highway was the biggest size obtainable, and every day the box was filled with mail addressed to Laura Ingalls Wilder. Classes wrote her, sending big packets of letters and drawings and photos of themselves. Teachers wrote to ask for pictures and autographs and answers to questions her student asked about little house books. Oh, I know that feeling. Patiently, Laura answered the mail. You would be astonished at the number of letters, Laura wrote to her new editor, Ursula Nordstrom at Harper and Brothers. I answered them for, I cannot bear to disappoint children. At Christmas, their loyal fans remembered Laura and Almanza Wilder and cards and gifts also arrived on birthdays and Valentine's Day. <laughs> Laura treasured each bit of affection for her books and her family. She proudly wore an an apron handmade for her by a girl in North Carolina and carefully saved cartons of admiring mail. Because Farmer Boy was such a popular book in the Little House series, Almanzo received his share of the fan mail. He seems to have made quite a hit with the children, Laura said in a letter to a college professor. Almanzo was surprised and pleased that they wrote to him. In 1940, wow, 1940, we're already up to 1940. The Long Winter was published. Laura's editors at Harper and Brothers had asked her to change her title from The Hard Winter, thinking the original choice sounded too grim for a book for children. Laura cheerfully complied. Well, she may have changed a title to not be so grim. It's still really grim. People are like freezing to death and starving, and it's, it's pretty darn grim, but there you go. Laura worked rapidly on her seventh book, which became Little Town on the Prairie. In the summer of 1941, the manuscript was sent to Ursula Nordstrom. I love these names. I love these names. It's, it's like made up. It's like somebody made this up. No, Ursula Nordstrom. It's like an actual person. The story of Laura Ingalls' teenage years on Paul's homestead and in the town of DeSmet thrilled Miss Nordstrom. Little town on the prairie, she wrote Laura, seems to me to be absolutely perfect on the banks of Plum Creek has up to now been my favorite, but I think the new one is even better. When Nellie Olson came into the school, I almost wept with pleasure and anticipation. Every single bit of the book is perfect. Ha ha ha! What did she like? The fact that Nellie was in it. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, Miss Nordstrom, Ursula Nordstrom was a Nellie fan. She was an Ellie fan. 
She she must have gone mad. I wonder if Ursula Nordstrom was still alive in 1974 and got to see the show and got to see me walk into the school as Nellie Olson. Oh, I hope she did. I hope Ursula was still around in 1974, at least got to see the first couple episodes. But that's amazing. She, Ursula's the Nellie head. She's like, oh, you brought Nellie back. And she got excited. Her favorite was On the Banks of Plum Creek. And this is someone who works at Harper, who's like read everything. And then she liked Little Town on the Creek. Nellie, Nellie. I'm, I'm very proud. Um, when it was published in 1941, Little Town on the Prairie became, again, a Newbery Honor book. Laura's fifth, fifth Newbery Honor book. Super good. Children eagerly anticipated the next book because in it, Laura was expected to marry Almanzo. Laura also announced that the eighth book in the series would be her last. Oh no. In the next book, Laura really grows up, she said. The last book became these happy golden years. Stories of Laura's teaching, her courtship with Almanzo, Pa and Ma's thriving homestead, and happy times in the growing town of Desmet all brought to a close the long saga of the Ingalls family. Oh, someone said, Ursula died when? When? <gasps> in 1988. Really? Retired in 70. Oh, she totally. Oh, thank you, Sarah. I now know Ursula Nordstrom lived into the 80s, so she, in theory, could have seen every single episode of Little House on the Prairie. I hope so. I hope she saw every episode. I hope she saw the Nelly episodes, and I hope she liked them. Little things like this make me so... <laughs> Yay, Ursula. Um, oh, she looked to be quite old. That's good. So, Happy Golden Years. Uh, Laura was pleased with the great interest in these Happy Golden Years. It always surprises me when... One of my books is a success, and I am glad that it is selling so well, she said. Letters poured in, praising these happy golden years. Carrie wrote, proud and excited with the book. Rose, too, complimented these happy golden years. She thinks you did a fine job on the book, Laura wrote Ursula Nordstrom. The final pages of these happy golden years included the line, The End of the Little House Books. Laura was 76 and ready to retire from 11 years of steady writing. It seems that my mind is tired, she explained. It, it refuses to work again on a book. George By, the New York agent who managed all of Laura's business with her publisher, encouraged her to continue writing. Yeah, well, no kidding. Because <laughs> he's getting 15%. <laughs> yeah, he's like, no, really write another one. <laughs> Or George. He's like, oh, come on, one more. I, I have a mortgage. Mm -mm. Uh, yes, of course he wanted more. He offered her the chance to write magazine stories and assured her that Harper and Brothers wanted more books. But Laura explained, she wanted to spend the rest of my life living it and not writing about it. Well, 11 years straight at cranking them out, you know. Okay, you take a break. But I can certainly see where Harper and the agent were like, no, really, keep going. So Manley and Laura settled into golden years at the end of their lives together. When they work, when their work in the house and garden was through, they played cribbage and read their magazines and papers. They enjoyed drives and dinners with Netta and Silas Seal. Netta always cooked special meals for the Wilder's February birthdays. Hey, Netta, Netta, isn't she the one who was very much still alive when I was visiting Missouri and and because she would have been on the board. Is Netta the one who put, she is, she's the one who pulled my hair, isn't she? I, there was the lovely elderly lady who was at Missouri and I met with, and they were talking about how she knew Laura and, and we have pictures of her pulling my hair and getting revenge on Nellie. <laughs> That's that Netta, isn't it? <gasps> so excited. So Netta always cooked special meals for the Wilder's February birthdays. Both Manley and Laura remained keenly interested in politics and world events. Their newspapers and the radio kept them informed of the news of World War II. Since the Wilders grew so much of their own food, they were not much affected by the wartime food rationing. We had time to tell you thought the Depression was bad. In World War II, we had, we had rationing. Rationing! Um, 
you can see, I remember the Bugs Bunny cartoons, even when I was a kid, still talking about rationing. You had to have, you have ration cards. You got a little card. You could only get, like, so much sugar and so much. But they were growing everything, so they were fine. Their trips to the in the Chrysler were limited by gas rationing. Uh, oh, yeah, we had that in the 70s, too, gas rationing, though. No longer could they think of a summer trip to South Dakota. As Laura explained to a distant friend, she could no longer visit. Our rubber is good, but our gas is short. Laura mourned along with the rest of America when she heard of fearful wartime battles and loss of life. In our quiet home, Laura said, it is hard to believe such terrible things are happening in the world. But yet, that's, that's true, the gas. You could remember they had um, posters in World War II that said, is this trip really necessary? Because they wanted people to conserve gas and all these products that they needed them for a group. Oh, yeah. Mm -mm -mm. Despite the difficulty of travel, Carrie was able to travel to Mansfield by train from Rapid City. Oh, Rapid City, South Dakota, in the fall of 1944. Ooh, almost over. It was an exciting reunion. The love of our early childhood, Laura told her, has followed you all the way. Carrie enjoyed visiting with Laura's friends and making short drives through the Ozark Mountains. Grace had died in 1941. Oh, that's quite young then. Laura had to write children that Sister Carrie and I are the only ones of our family now living. Laura, Carrie, and Rose decided together that Pa's fiddle should be preserved in a museum. Yes. South Dakota seemed to be the right place for such an important part of the Ingalls history. Laura's books were appreciated there and were often promoted by Aubrey Sherwood in the De Smith News. A student from Watertown, South Dakota, wrote Laura, I think you have helped a lot of boys and girls become interested in their own state. After my teacher finished the long winter, one of the kids said, I never knew South Dakota had a history like that. Wonder what they thought when they saw Deadwood. <laughs> South Dakota, very exciting little place. So Pa's fiddle went back to the prairie. It was accepted by the South Dakota State Historical Society and kept on display for many years in the museum across from the Capitol building in Pierre. Children and adults constantly stopped at the museum to see the fiddle. I'll bet. The greatest pleasure Laura received from her writing was the knowledge that Pa would not be forgotten. In this she knew she had succeeded. That's what she, she didn't even do it like she wanted to be remembered. She wanted Pa to be remembered. And all his little songs and the fiddle and, and his jokes and how funny. She wanted Pa to be, and she, and she did. Look. And Michael Landon just took it, ain't nobody gonna forget Pa now. <laughs> no way. It's so sweet. So many children begged Laura for another book that she was half persuaded to begin one. I, I find myself constructing sentences and situations in what might be another book, Laura admitted. I, I must begin to think about it, she decided. Finally, Laura told Ursula Nordstrom, I will see if I can make the new book jail. <gasps> Daily living finally crowded out the time Laura sought for writing another book. Manley was close to 90. 90! And he and Laura both complained how hard it was to hire any help for the house, yard, and garden. Well, remember, it was World War II. They're saying, I don't know why you can't. It's World War II. Any young man, any able bodied man, young, he's under 40, is at the front. It's near the end of World War II. There's all the men, especially you know, somewhere in Missouri, they're all in World War II. There, there's no men. That's why they had you know, Rosie the River. They got the women working in the factory. They might have gotten a couple of guys' wives to come down and work, but. I want a man to be found for miles. They're all at the war. Terrible. So, yet, yeah, no help for the house. Rose was permanently settled in Danbury, Connecticut. Too far away to do anything but advise her parents through her letters. We like to live here, but wish our only child did not live so far away, Laura said. The Wilders had one last great adventure equal to any they experienced in their early days on the prairie. Oh, yes, on April 12, 1945, the same day that President Roosevelt died, a terrific cyclone 
blew through the Ozarks. Rocky Ridge Farmhouse stood solid, though one of the big living room windows was blown out and shingles from the roof were scattered. The yard suffered more damage. Big old oaks were uprooted, split and twisted. Trees were thrown across the driveway. For two weeks, the Wilders could not drive out of the yard, and there were no telephone, no telephone, there was no telephone or electricity. They'd just gotten used to having it. The seals, oh good, the seals came over. The seals made their way out to Rocky Ridge, but many days passed before the trees could be cleared away. Right, and then if all the guys are away at work, who do you get to come over and move the tree? It was quite a return to former times, being isolated with your coal oil lamps for lights, Laura reported. You see, Omanzo and I have had still another adventure and escaped. Laura wrote Carrie to assure her that she and Manley were safe after the Missouri cyclone. Well, they also must have laughed because they built the house to be so strong. They were used to tornadoes and they had, they had the wood burning stove and they had the garrison lamps and they had all the food. So they probably sat there going, hey, okay, so it's like how we used to do this. It's no, no big deal. It's, it's like going back in time. It was one of Laura's last letters to her sister. In June of 1946, Carrie died. She was buried with the rest of the Ingalls family in the cemetery in Desmet. While the Wilders were living life on Rocky Ridge, Laura's books were becoming internationally famous. Because remember, it's World War II. So we're now, it's, it's, we're talking to all these other countries, and after World War II, everyone is like, we've got all these alliances. So it's like, hey, you want to read our books? Immediately after World War II, the United States State Department, at the urging of, get this, General Douglas MacArthur, seriously, this really happened, General Douglas MacArthur arranged for Little House books to be translated into German and Japanese. Did you know that? You did not know that. Because Laura's books provided an accurate picture of American life. He believed that Germans and Japanese would benefit from reading them. Well, also after World War II, a lot of countries, the ones even to our side, you know, France, etc., became fascinated with Americans. They suddenly, many people met Americans for the first time in World War II because we went all over the world. And they were like, hey, this America play really interesting. And then said, oh, there's these books. And they started reading. And then, yes, now that Germany and Japan were sort of, you know, we were the conquering country, we we're like, here. We're not always shooting at you. You should read these books. We can be nice sometimes. <laughs> so they were, th they were, and they were fascinated with them. They, said they became very big in Japan. The Japanese were fascinated with Little House books. Letters immediately started coming to Laura from Germany and Japan. Translations of Little House books were published in several other countries as well, much to Laura's amazement. Though you are far away and speak a different language, Laura wrote to the Japanese children, Still, the things worthwhile in life are the same for us all and the same when I was a child so long ago. So that's why the TV show wound up being dubbed into every language on earth. And the TV show, yep, Little House, hugely popular in Germany and huge, 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 hugely popular in Japan. And of course, the French, well, they're, half of them are on here now. Bonjour. The, the French love Little House in the Prairie and um, the Argentinians. Go figure. In America, Laura's fame constantly grew. Librarians and teachers and families still stopped to see the Wilders and were shown around the house and yard by Manley and Laura. Children in the Pacific Northwest voted Laura their favorite author. That's pretty nice. All right. Uh, and she was presented with Harry Hartman Award. I don't know that one. The Harry Hartman Award. In 1947, a poll of 55,000 Chicago children clearly showed Laura was their favorite writer. This led to a celebration of Laura's 80th birthday in Chicago. A department store there held a birthday party in Laura's honor on February 7, 1947. Laura and Manley were invited to attend and to appear on the Hobby Horse radio program, but they could not go. Manley was 90 and not strong. Laura would not leave him. So that the children would not be too disappointed, Laura mailed 200 autographs to the store and a letter telling all about her life since the Little House books. She closed her letter with this message to young readers. 
The little house books are stories of long ago. The way we live and your schools are much different now, but many changes have been made living have made living and learning easier. But the real things haven't changed. It is still best to be honest and truthful, to make the most of what we have, to be happy with simple pleasures, and to be cheerful and have courage when things go wrong. Yes, nailed it, nailed it, Laura, yes. The Little House book sold so well that Harper and Brothers arranged to publish new editions with new illustrations. Yay! Garth Williams, yay! Garth Williams, the Garth Williams drawings, loving the Garth Williams drawings. Garth Williams was selected to do the new drawings, and they are awesome. Since he knew little of the country described in the books, he decided to travel west and see it for himself. The first stop on Garth... Ah, he, he, heaving away here. The first stop on Garth Williams' track into the past was Mansfield. In September of 1947, he arrived to see the Wilders. As he drove through the gate at Rocky Ridge, he spied Laura picking up walnuts. When they went into the house to talk with Manley, Garth was almost overwhelmed. Imagine, he marveled. Here I stood with the hero and heroine of the Little House books. What could be more exciting? Garth Williams went on to visit all the places Laura wrote about. When his travels were over, he began to recreate the little house life in his illustrations. It would take him six years, I did not know that, six years to finish his work. The Wilders knew they were important in bookstores, libraries, and schools across America. Even so, they never forgot their long tradition on Rocky Ridge. They were eager to keep the land dedicated to farming, and they were concerned over what might happen to their beloved home in the future. They knew that Rose was not interested in returning to the Ozarks. A young couple, Harland and Gerida, Gerida, G-I-R-E-D-A, Gerida, shorter, had purchased the Rock House and part of Rocky Ridge in the 19, early 1940s. The Wilders watched their farming operation with interest, and in 1948, they made a decision. They wanted the Shorters to have the farm. One Sunday morning, Laura telephoned the Shorters and asked them to come for a visit. When they arrived, she and Manley sat on the porch swing and offered to sell the Shorters their house and all the remaining Rocky Ridge farm. They could pay $50 a month and allow the Wilders to live there for the rest of their lives. Aww. The agreement was made. Manley said he was glad to have the steady monthly income. Sort of like a reverse mortgage. <laughs> it's like, you get to stay here until you're done, and then we get it there. Surprising news came to the Wilders in December of 1948. The Detroit Public Library planned to open a new branch library and name it for Laura Ingalls Wilder. It would be the first library in the city named for a living person and for a woman. Mm-hmm. Laura was amazed at the news. Unfortunately, she had to say she could not attend the dedication plan for the spring of 1949. Manley was too feeble to be left alone. But Laura helped with the preparations by sending a message to be read at the ceremony, along with the original manuscripts for The Long Winter and These Happy Golden Years, which were to be presented to the library. Manley planted the garden during the spring of 1949, but at 92, he moved slowly and sometimes painfully. In July, he suffered a serious heart attack. Wait, 92, for heaven's sake. Laura nursed him faithfully through his recovery. Netta and Silas Seal helped. They brought groceries and food and drove Laura to town when she needed to go. Netta often slept on the porch during the nights in case Laura needed help. Well, that's pretty good. Through the early fall, Manly improved. But on Sunday morning, October 23rd, he had a second heart attack. Laura quickly called Netta and Silas to come, but by the time they had arrived, Manly had died. Boo! Oh, they made it to 92. You know, in 1949, that's when Nellie, Nellie Owens, I've been, I've been to her grave. I've been to my grave. She died in 1949. So... We don't know 
But Nellie absolutely could have read all the books. She would have known Laura was insanely famous, as you saw, by the 40s. And so we don't know. Did Nellie know? No. So Manzo died in 1949. But 92, 92, I thought. I guess it's a full life, right? I mean, what did he not get to do? All right, so tomorrow, Chapter 18, A Rich Harvest. And then we'll figure something out. I'll <laughs> read more stuff. Um, and it'll be, thank you, thank you again, thank you for brittle and fudge and my car in miniature, um, and thank you guys, and we'll see you tomorrow, and, um, yes, you should, uh, wash your hands, and wear your masks, and call your friends, and I guess eat more pecan pie, the pecan people really seem to be pushing that pecan pie kind of thing, um, so thank you, thank you so much, and I will see you tomorrow, and, um, Things, things are happening. Um, I'm doing my show again, September 24th. I'll be over there. And then we're going to have um, Nellie's Scary Prairie and Nellie's Nasty Noel. <laughs> so, I will see you.